It's October 20th, 1847, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. It was on this day that a 12-year-old London boy named William Allnut tipped arsenic into the family sugar bowl. And five days later, his sweet-toothed grandfather Samuel Nelm was dead, having dipped into the poison bowl on several occasions, actually. And Allnut was arrested and put on trial in this case that became a total media sensation and ended up centering as much on Allnut's mental state as it did on his youth. And it's safe to say that there had been warning signs. William had been living with his grandfather because his father had died an insane, violent alcoholic. So you can see there's like there's some troubling backstory here. And William had already been caught and confessed to stealing money, which is one thing. However, just before the murder, things had taken a more ominous turn when a mysterious pistol shot was fired at Samuel Nelm in his garden, just missing his head. Yeah, so this was reported by the papers at the time as like mystery gunfire in garden young boy says granddad someone's trying to shoot you (laughs) and then it emerged that he had actually purloined the gun and attempted to kill his own grandfather and the whole thing was slightly hushed up i mean when you're looking back on it from the post-murder perspective it does seem slightly telling that william was so nearby when this mystery person shot at him and was apparently the only person to see him escape over the wall and also very indicative of the time period that a 12 year old boy was able to (laughs) pop into town and buy a gun rather than taking another pop at his grandfather he threw the gun away and was like whoa granddad where did that come from whoo sheesh lucky we escaped that one eh you and me together (laughs) no one died (laughs) well (laughs) <laughs> There's a naivety to it, isn't there, which comes from the fact that he was a child yeah. at the time when he was 12 years old. And the heartbreaking thing now, looking back on the court testimony around the case, all these adults that were around him repeating things that in retrospect are obviously horrifying. So he'd told the nurse, oh, my grandfather's going to die suddenly soon. Uh, and she'd just taken it as the kind of, you know, innocent uh, approach of a child. And don't worry, poor lad, he'll <laughs> yeah. be fine. Uh, and his own mother, Maria Ulna, he'd asked her, what does arsenic look like just a few weeks before? He was saying, is it true that it looks like flour? I and mean, he was looking for the arsenic because he had this mm. plan of putting it in the sugar bowl, which in itself, by the way, is quite a bold sort of poison roulette way to poison a specific member of your family, isn't it? He obviously had it in for his grandfather, but he put the arsenic in the sugar bowl that the whole family had right. access to. Yeah, and his mother and step-grandmother also became pretty sick over this time period. Both of them recovered, but it was well known that his grandfather had a soft spot for baked apples as his pudding, which he coated with liberal helpings of powdered sugar. So <laughs> there was a certain amount of premeditation there. In court, William had gone to say that he, the reason he did this was that his grandfather had apparently, while he was telling him off, had struck him over the head and knocked him down and he'd hit his head on the table, which may have been particularly triggering to William because he had already had two serious head injuries. Mm. And we now know that, that that is a common element of the backstory of some people who do go on to commit these kind of serious, violent crimes. Yes, not only had he fallen from a plowshare, which had left him uh, temporarily paralysed and unable to speak for a while, but it also apparently fallen on the ice and hit his head. And then other doctors of his testified that he'd had ringworm and several abscesses. And all of this kind of medical prehistory, I think, was then brought up in court to find reasons behind what led him to the mental state of murder. But almost on an equal basis. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, looking back on court testimony from the Victorian era. And there are verbatim passages of this uh, in the Old Bailey archives. Almost on an equal basis, people were talking about the fact that he'd once sold on a pocket watch. You know, as if that's the same thing. As if, like, a serious bash to the head that leaves you paralysed or a history of mental illness or trying to kill your grandfather with a pistol (laughs) is equivalent in your case history (laughs) to (laughs) one day you stole a pocket watch. But I feel like this was the time that this concept of juvenile delinquency was really gaining traction. Also, the Artful Dodger is kind of the famous one, isn't it, from literature. But it was this idea of, like, how can this kid who's in a middle-class home, basically, like, his grandfather's a property owner, you know, they lived in Hackney, he was 74 years old, he was being brought up the right way, he was basically having the upbringing that Oliver Twist Mm. wanted, right? Why would he go and steal a pocket watch? What's going on there? It was seen as, like, a real red flag. 
And there was almost an element as well that his mother was on trial because she goes to great pains in her testimony to stress that she has several other children. She's raised them in the None right way. None of them way. killed their grandfather. <laughs> None of yeah. them killed granddad. <laughs> she says, I've taken great pains with him because it's been so difficult to raise him because of his odd behaviour. You know, the implication being he's not like my other children. There's something wrong with him. It's definitely not wrong with me. Well, the similarity between this crime and the stolen pocket watch was that the policeman in question who uh, nicked him for uh, taking that pocket watch testified that uh, Allnut said that voices in his head told him to steal this watch. And that Mm. came to be a thing that he claimed uh, actually only after the prison chaplain got up and said, listen, Allnut, you should confess your crimes to God. And he then goes away and writes this letter to his mother in which he says, look, I did actually do this crime. The defence then argued that he had been put up to saying that under duress and he'd been driven to it by the chaplain himself. So they tried to row that back a little bit. But then this other letter from Allnut to his mother was produced in which he says, "Uh, When I'm reading or lying down at night, I fancy I see someone and it does startle me so and makes my heart beat so. And when I look, I see no one and I lay down again and I fancy I can see it again and I get up again and I ask it what it wants and it mutters something, but I do not know what it says. So there's this story emerging of him being told to do things by voices, and that comes to underpin his defence's claim that he was insane when he did this crime. Yeah, so you're allowed to plead insanity at this point because there's a burgeoning understanding of insanity, as they called it, and his father, as Rebecca said, had been insane when he died by their labels then. But the kind of general attitude of uh, the general public on the jury, but also specifically the judge, had not caught up (laughs) The way the law had evolved. Uh, so Baron Rolf, who was the judge, advised the jury regarding the, the pleading of insanity that, quote, such evidence ought to be scanned by juries with very great jealousy and suspicion because it might tend to justify every crime that was mm. committed. Isn't that a strange idea? Like you'd be jealous as a juror mm. that the decision for like crime and punishment is being taken out of your hand by some clever lawyer using sophistry to argue insanity <laughs> when this clear was clearly <laughs> Completely disturbed. From well, an early age. Or is the jealousy that he kind of he got away with it, and you know I could have murdered my mm. grandfather <laughs> with arsenic, and I <laughs> I didn't get away with that. How dare he? As Arian was saying, there was a big media circus around the case, and also around the guilty verdict. The overwhelming opinion seemed to be that it was a really good thing that he'd been found guilty. He was found guilty in 15 mm. minutes as well, yeah. um, because it meant that he wasn't getting away on this idea that he was insane. There was a newspaper called Bell's Life in London, and They welcomed the guilty verdict and they noted, critically, of late it has become a kind of mania with a certain class of people to talk of the crime being committed under an uncontrollable impulse and an effect to call that impulse madness. Mm. You also see, I guess, like competing narratives about childhood going on in this era, don't you? So by the end of the century, you're looking at the foundation of the NSPCC by the 1880s, the age of consent being raised from 13 to 16. But at this point... It's kind of like, well, yes, but we still have like working children being sent up chimneys and that's fine, thank you. And, you know, children should be treated like little adults when they kill Mm. people. And there's a conflict, isn't there? Like the establishment doesn't quite know which way they want to go with this. Yes, the idea that children should even be treated differently uh, to adults in court wasn't changed until 1847. So, in fact, the year we're talking about. Right. So it's at that sweet spot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was thinking about why Nelm had this ready supply of arsenic lying around. And apparently in Victorian times, arsenic found its way into loads of products, just regular products like wallpaper and bread even. And it was used in baby carriages and stuff. And also it was this cheap and readily available form of rat killer. Um, And it was even used as a medication to treat everything from like asthma to cancer to skin problems. So lots of people had it. And it wasn't until 1851 that the Sale of Arsenic Act passed through the British Parliament to try to limit its distribution. But even then, it wasn't stopping it from being sold. It just required that you kept a paper trail so that if people did end up dead, uh, you could trace it back to the person who who had bought it. Whereas the wine was kept in a locked cellar. So we have this from All Nuts Confession from prison. Right. On the 20th of October, (laughs) Grandfather went to his desk for the key of the wine cellar 
to get some wine up and to look over his accounts. Whilst he was gone, I took the poison out and emptied some of it into another piece of paper and put it in the sugar basin. <laughs> Only arsenic was lying in the desk <laughs> yeah. where he got the key to get a bottle of wine. I mean, priorities have changed, haven't they? Yeah. I get the sense that Nelm didn't really know what aspects he needed to keep an eye on in terms of his <laughs> grandson. <laughs> Should have had an arsenic cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. He originally wanted the whole thing to be painted red on its exterior, which, as we all know, it definitely is not. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the ACAST Creator Network.